Severe weather across Metro Detroit leaves several neighborhoods dealing with another round of flooding. And now more than 800,000 homes are without power this afternoon on what is shaping up to be a muggy, uncomfortable day all across Metro Detroit, particularly if you don't have AC or even electricity to power that fan. That does top our news. Thank you so much for joining us this noon. The outages continue to climb as the cleanup begins from another round of severe weather, and we are all exhausted from it, aren't we? Here's a look at the very latest from DTE on the outage map, and you can see it is all over the place. Widespread outages all across Southeast Michigan. As I mentioned, we're up to about 800,000 customers without power this afternoon. DTE says more that there are more than 1,800 crews members that are out in the field working to restore power, but it is not clear how long it could take. I'm one of those people and there are no updates in terms of when restoration will happen. They're still trying to get around to assess the situation uh, in so many of these communities, but there are many, many power lines down, so it's going to take a long time to fix this. Consumers Energy also reporting more than 241,000 outages. This is for western and central parts of lower Michigan. So you combine all that together between DTE and Consumer Energy and we're looking at the largest since a windstorm in 2017 in terms of power outages, which resulted in nearly 1 million outages statewide. And we are ever close right now. Meteorologist Brandon Rue is watching over the storms that were and also what could be coming our way and of course how hot it is. Yes, and I know Rhonda is without power. I was earlier in the week. I also lost a giant evergreen in that 2017 storm, so I remember that. The big wind gust, hurricane force, 75 miles an hour Wednesday in Mount Clemens. You can see Romulus, where the uh, airport is, about 63 mile an hour wind gusts. Oxford, 60. Ann Arbor, Gross Point, all in the 50s to near 60 mile an hour wind gusts, so it can knock over trees. It can knock limbs onto power lines, big problems. And then look at the big winners from the overnight rain, almost five inches in Fowlerville, not winners, I get it, but the highest totals, uh, three to almost five inches. Ann Arbor, Whitmore Lake, Garden City, Pinckney, man, oh man. So we've had enough. We are near 80 degrees. It's starting to really warm up and we're getting set for 90 with humidity. So dangerous heat index and heat illness issues. We'll talk about that and storm chances that still exist, Rhonda. The local forecasters app, always your greatest weapon and tool for storms of any kind. It's free. Search WDIV. All right, Brandon, thank you. Not to mention all of the flooding and the morning's commute was stressful and in some cases dangerous. Take a look at the right side of your screen. It shows one driver going a little too fast for these conditions, losing control, hydroplaning along I-96 right at Chilson and Howell. Thankfully, that driver was able to regain control without hitting anything, but parts of that freeway were closed this morning because of all the flooding. Lots of judgment calls being made behind the wheel this morning as people try to get to work and to wherever they needed to be. As we take a look here, this is a look at I-75 just south of 696, which eventually had to be closed. But before that, some drivers took the chance while others just stopped right there and got out of their vehicles, deciding not to risk getting stuck. At least one car did get stuck. That red one you see right there on your screen on the northbound side of I-75 right near John R. And of course, it's not a flooding event without trouble along I-94 in western Wayne County. Some parts of that freeway in the Dearborn, Dearborn Heights area were impassable as as well. Here's a look at I-94 at Vernier for folks on the east side where the westbound lanes were swamped. So this was happening all across the metro area. Another problem area in Metro Detroit, of course, has been Dearborn Heights where residents there have been dealing with round after round of flooding in their homes and on their streets. Rob Maloney joins us now live and deja vu all over again and not in a good way. No, not. And, and Rhonda, this is the good view of this. The water's actually receded quite a bit. But look behind me here. You see the trash that's on the ground here. That was put out like three weeks ago, the last time they had this kind of a rain and a flood. The neighbors obviously are getting tired of this mess. So what do you do when your suburban street is really a lake? 
Well, you pull out the inflatable boat, of course. You do have to dodge the floating mattresses and the trash cans, though. This is Hanover Street at Telegraph and Dearborn Heights. It and Courier back up to the overflowing Ecorse Creek. Windswept rains just kept coming overnight. And this real boat, looking like it's floating, actually its trailer is hidden underwater. This neighborhood gets hit hard with every heavy rain event. And this guy, who goes only by Junior, says he spends lots of time here with his friend's family. And he's helped them bail out the house regularly, especially this summer. Yeah, and it ruined, and it ruined like everything. Look, ruined everything like every other month. It's ruined. The basement's flood. The back's flood if, if you have backs. Like from the creek, the whole backyard's flooded out. Yeah, so is your buddy going to move? I mean, I guess they got no choice. One of the things making these floodwaters worse is the drivers, who are convinced the water isn't too deep for their vehicle. This pickup stalled with its lights on, no one inside. This SUV driver stalled out on Ollie Cox's front yard, and the weight caused him even worse trouble. And they drive through it, and it sends it right down my basement wall, right down my door. Fills my basement full of stinky, nasty sewer water. Ollie's so angry he called the Dearborn Heights police. And the driver in this car went until it started floating. Dan Murray tells us didn't have to end up this way, likely permanently damaged. It's just silly that the, you know, he tried it, made it halfway, and then turned, kind of backed it back out, and then to try it again, it don't figure. A lot doesn't figure out here. The residents here are quite upset that they feel that the city should be doing more to help them out. The city, of course, doesn't have that much in the way of resources, so we'll have to see where all of this ends up. Back to you. Well, of course, there's a lot of questions, Rod, in terms of the city and what can be done to help these residents to stop this mm -hmm. from happening over and over again. Are they answering that question of what they can do to help? Well, what we're hearing out here is that there are some resources where they've been able to buy about five houses uh, down the street here. They've been making offers and buying the houses with the intent of demolishing them. I just spoke to the owner of this house right here. The remnants that you see there are from renters that he uh, had leave a couple of weeks ago. He wants to sell his house to the city. Hasn't heard yet, but he's certainly hoping that there is that opportunity. Oh, you certainly hope for help for all of these families that have been dealing with this over and over again. Just awful. Rod, thank you. The severe storms knocked out power to several places, including a senior living facility in Westland, leaving dozens of seniors in the dark without air conditioning or electricity on what's expected to be, as we've been saying, a very hot, humid day. Let's get to Tim Pamplin, who joins us now live with their conditions. Yeah, hi, Rod. This is the Ashford uh, Court. Uh, assisted living facility, independent living facility, and it has a memory care facility in the back. The memory care is the issue. They have equipment back there that needs power. This building has no generator. Power's been out since three o'clock yesterday. They've moved some residents out as I make my way in here. About 100 residents inside Ashford Court. They say there's a generator coming. It's coming from Chicago. It's gonna take some time to get here as we walk inside. Residents have been sequestered into their living areas. There's a few out in the dining area, but very dark inside here. As we step back outside. Now, some of those residents that need the medical equipment, oxygen tanks, they've been moved over to this side of the building. Funnily enough, this one over here, it's part of Ashford Court. It's on a different grid. They have power for so some residents that need the electricity on a life saving situation are in there. We'll have much more on Ashford Court's dilemma coming up at four, five and six to you. All right, Tim, thank you. And thankfully, there is at least a building there on a different grid that does have power. We will continue to monitor the outages and updates for you, <coughs> excuse me, from DTE all day long right here on Local 4 and click on Detroit.com. The nation's top infectious disease doctor says that there will be inevitably be a time when we will all need an additional COVID-19 booster shot. But for now, only the immunocompromised will get them. Dr. Fauci expected to FDA approval for vaccine booster shots in an interview on today this morning. Inevitably, there will be a time when we'll have to give boosts. What we're doing literally on a weekly and monthly basis is following cohorts of patients to determine if, when, and whom should get it. But right now, at this moment, other than the immune compromised, yeah. we're not going to be giving boosters to people. 
The FDA's announcement will come as the COVID infections and hospitalizations continue to rise across the South, where vaccination rates are lower. Morgan Chesky has the latest from hard hit Dallas, Texas. As infections surge nationwide, new questions about the need for booster shots. Today, the FDA is expected to authorize third doses for immunocompromised people who produce little to no antibodies after the first two shots. There are still no plans yet, though, for boosters for the general population. A new study by the Mayo Clinic, still not peer reviewed, found after six months, the Pfizer vaccine was only 42% effective during the height of the Delta variant, compared to Moderna's 76%. Pfizer says its trials showed only a minimal reduction in effectiveness. Researchers found both vaccines still offer robust protection against hospitalization and death. Now debate heating up over new mandates. California is requiring all school staff to be vaccinated or get weekly tests, becoming the first state to do so. Cities and states also reissuing indoor mask mandates, including Philadelphia and Oregon. In Texas, Governor Greg Abbott is now threatening to take any school district who breaks his no mask mandate to court. Some superintendents defiant and still requiring masks. We've been really clear that the most important consequence that we're looking at is how we keep people safe. This as the CDC updates its guidance for pregnant women, now urging them to get vaccinated because they're at higher risk for severe disease and evidence shows the shots are safe. Now, as for those booster shots, the CDC is slated to discuss them at a special advisory panel set for this upcoming Friday. In the meantime, we're hearing growing numbers of reports of people finding out a way to get that third dose, even if it's something that medical professionals don't recommend. Morgan Chesky, NBC News, Dallas. All right, Morgan, thank you. Here at home, the state's vaccination rate is at 64.3%. Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan joined mayors across the country today to voice their support for the passage of the next part of President's of the President Biden's Build Back Better plan. The family focus phase would do things like permanently expand the child tax credit and provide free universal pre-kindergarten. Mayor Duggan said that he can get behind that. What? this proposal is trying to do is say we really believe in this country everybody should have the potential to go where their talents and work ethic will take them and let's eliminate the barriers because a lot of the economic inequality in this country starts with inequality opportunities uh, when our young folks are four years old 10 years old 20 years old uh, and this is the first uh, real plan in my lifetime that says we're not just going to talk about it for once, we're going to address these inequities. Mayor Duggan said that he's been fired up after recently meeting a star DPSCD student who told of how upset he was to be starting at a community college this fall instead of at a four year university despite graduating near the top of his class. A reminder, hundreds of thousands of DTE customers, we're talking about 800,000 customers, are without power all across the Metro Detroit area. And it's likely to stay that way for hours and probably days for many people. Still ahead, Brandon will break down the severe weather that got here, that hit us so hard, and what could be coming our way next.